Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction, the podcast. Let's take tech in the right direction to drive social change and close the employment, pay, and culture gap for women in technology. This podcast is focused on helping turn ideas into action and create opportunities for women to advance in the dynamic technology industry. I hope this podcast will inspire and motivate you to encourage more women and girls to seek or grow a career as a woman in technology. Stories about the journey of amazing women in the tech field starts right now. Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction, the podcast. This week, I'll be speaking with Ashley Wilson. Ashley is a San Francisco-based entrepreneur raised by a used car salesman and an elevator guy. Tapping into her roots, Ashley opened and sold multiple small businesses by the age of 20 until ultimately landing in the elevator business. It was quickly discovered that customers were an afterthought, and she made it her mission to prove that putting people first is profitable. Welcome to the show, Ashley. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Great. Well, let's get started. Can you share with us your career journey and how you got to where you are today? Absolutely. So I have been an entrepreneur since I could remember. I mean, one of my earliest memories of learning what the word even meant was (laughs) I had taken a a bucket um, and some cleaning supplies to the golf course in the neighborhood and was cleaning golf clubs. And a woman had called me an entrepreneur. And I remember running home to my mom because I thought that she had called me a name (laughs) and I didn't know what it meant. Um, But from there, I was a bank teller at a high school and I was like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. I'm working all these hours for like $7 an hour. And again, went and went and got a bucket and a mop and I started a cleaning business, um, which my family thought was hilarious because I am not a very tidy person. (laughs) And since then, it's just been idea after idea, with the exception of joining the elevator industry, which my stepdad has been in my entire life, uh, in my early 20s, like right around graduate school time. And I was in the industry about five or six years. And that is when I really found the problem in which um, Automate, my company, solved. So I found there that customers didn't really understand their contracts, that elevator companies really weren't doing their job, and no one knew any better. Everybody just paid the bills. And it, it really messed with my values and morals and and so I left and, and Audit Mate was born out of that. That's amazing. I loved you take initiative and just take a bucket and some cleaning supplies and go start your own business. I love, love, love that. <laughs> um, so I know you firmly believe in people over profits. Can you tell us more? Yeah, absolutely. I believe that when we focus on people, profits follow. And I believe when we focus on profits, we lose sight of our people. And it's really simple to me. And it kind of is mind blowing to me that the rest of the world doesn't operate this way. It's in one of those, those areas that I'm like, I just don't get it. Like, why would we not invest in our people? Why would we not invest in education and training and make sure everyone has transparency with their role and with the company? And and then we get more buy-in. People are more loyal. People want to be there. Like, it's really the only way to me. And that's so true. I really believe that from day one when I ran my business, that, you know, profits come if you do right by people, whether it's your customers, whether it's your employees, you always do the right thing and the profits will come with it. Um, so you have really good insight and obviously, you know, bought and sold many businesses and and an entrepreneur at heart. So you understand it right to the core, which I love. So let's talk about leadership, leadership in tech. Uh, What do you think it take, does it take to make a great leader? And what are some of the challenges you've seen throughout your career and overcome that we can learn from? 
I think it takes a lot of therapy. (laughs) 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 Um, But jokes aside, it takes a lot of personal reflection and a lot of digging out our own stuff and being aware of our unconscious bio bias and being aware that not everybody learns the same way that we do not everybody receives information the same way that we do and not everyone is going to work the same way that we do so how do we keep that individuality in mind and allow people to flourish in their own ways but yet keep still still keep business objectives right like you can teach anyone to be a manager Mm-hmm. But learning to be a leader is tough work. So have you had in your in your career, if you had bad leaders, what did that look like? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, I've definitely, you know, I don't know that there are any bad leaders. I think there's bad managers, right? <laughs> like um, to be a leader to me means that we are leading people and we're learning from our people and that our people believe in the direction that we're going and managers to me are you know there to just manage manage folks like manage business manage manage P&Ls so I've definitely had managers that focus so hard on the numbers or the initiatives that they aren't taking any consideration of the human experience that that goes into the work that we do or stick to policies and procedures so much without looking at does this policy make sense does this objective make sense does this priority Mm -hmm. actually make sense and serve the goal or are we just doing this priority to check a box um so i would say the bad managers or bad leaders don't have the bird's eye view of how do we get to where we need to go with the folks that we have and fostering everybody's personal growth and everybody's initiative to, to move, move in the same direction. Yeah, I agree. I think leaders are definitely need to take steps to inspire and motivate and make people feel good. The managers of the day to day, you know, yeah what's the numbers what what are the tasks how do we get there and you're spot on with that so that's very true now um one of the topics i know you're very passionate about is permission to be human allowing space for our whole selves can you share us share with us your thoughts on that yes that is one of my favorite lines permission to be human uh to me it means we're all doing this human experience thing and we all have our own version of it and the idea of leaving your personal life at home and you know dropping it at the door in my eyes is is kind of bs it's not really possible if we have if we're going through trauma at home our nervous system is still going through trauma at work Mm -hmm. it doesn't Mm -hmm. stop and so we make mistakes And we learn from the mistakes, right? And if we aren't allowed to to be creative and to screw things up and to be honest with with our leaders and with our coworkers about how things make us feel, then then we don't have any pulse on our culture. Mm -hmm. That is so true. And permission to be human is really being authentic, right? Just being yourself Mm -hmm. and coming with your whole self, allowing space for your whole self, like you say. That's amazing. Like It's so important. And that's when you really put people first before profits or business or anything. You say, come be yourself because then everything else will follow. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. It's, It's not easy. No. It takes a lot of work, and especially we have teammates that spend a long time in corporate America, and it's tough for them sometimes to be honest right away mm-hmm. and to not feel like they're going to be shamed or punished for having feelings about something in regard to business. Like we have to do a lot of unlearning as we onboard people. Yeah, and everybody is different, like you said. 
um, inclusivity is so important, you know, to make sure that people are coming to themselves, coming to the the workplace in a whole fashion. So they're really giving everything they have and it's down to their core. It's not just somebody who they're trying to be. That's so true. You know, one of our values is being radically inclusive. Mm. I don't think it's enough anymore to just be diverse and inclusive. You have Mm -hmm. to be proactively inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that looks like inviting new people to lunch with you, extending invites, you know, everyone is responsible to uphold that inclusivity. It's not just one Mm -hmm. person's job. And it's not easy. I mean, you know, people Mm -hmm. have so many unconscious biases, like you said, Mm -hmm. Uh, they come from different walks of life, they come from different neighborhoods, different education, all of those types of things. So we have to be open minded and we have to learn who we are ourselves first before we can be open to others. That's absolutely true. And those diverse teams that you were just speaking of, Mm -hmm. I I went to, uh, I think it was called, I think it's called the Neuro Institute. I went to a big diversity and inclusion Mm -hmm. seminar a few years ago, and they talked about how in diverse teams, it doesn't feel as good. There is more tension. Diverse teams often feel like they're not performing as well. And then homogenous teams feel like they are are performing better. But Mm -hmm. the end result, the diverse team always has the better end result Mm -hmm. than the homogenous team. Because those different perspectives, those different cultures, those different mindsets ultimately create a better product and environment because we have have more voices in it. Mm -hmm. And think of your customers. They're diverse. They're Mm -hmm. not all the same. So if you have a diverse perspective at the table looking to serve that population, you need to have that diversity and thought process. And then that, I mean, there's studies that show that diverse teams uh, outperform homogenous teams by profitability. I mean, the profitability is sky high in diverse teams. So you're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree, which, you know, comes to the topic of building AI, right? And the the morals and ethics that are involved in who's building AI for for certain groups of people, right? So interesting. Very, very interesting. And that's going to take its own turns uh, and evolve over time. I mean, it's in its infancy right now, but there is a lot of, you know, morals and ethics that have to be considered on the AI side. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's now, right. More STEM programs in schools, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're both extremely passionate about equality in the tech industry. So what can we do to scale our efforts and change this world and make a difference? We've talked about inclusion. We've talked about diversity. What else can we do to make sure that our world becomes more equal to everybody, not just, you know, a certain type of person. Yeah, you know, isn't it funny that this was your question after my STEM STEM programs need to be uh-huh. in schools? Um, I think that's one of the answers, right? Is is making technology education accessible to everybody and not mm-hmm. just Ivy Leaguers, right? Right. Um, and and not having any sort of biases in who gets into STEM pro- programs. We don't need to look a certain way or be a certain gender right. to right. be better at STEM, right? And that starts so young. That social conditioning starts so young. Mm-hmm. And then we get into funding, which is its own icky, ugly beast right now. Mm-hmm. With When you look at the percentages of, of who's being funded from venture mm-hmm. capitalists and who's not right like right. we need equal access to education we need equal access to funding and that'll change a lot of stuff and that has a long way to go i think today women businesses get like two percent of venture capitalist funding yeah. which is ridiculous 
Absolutely. And then if you look at the, the number of black women percentage, it's like right. point, point 0.1, point 0.2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Black, Hispanic, pe- women of color, forget it. You know, I mean, they're not even on the map. Yeah, yep. so that's right. We definitely need to change that. So who inspires you and why? Oh, good question. So <laughs> many people. I think I get inspiration from everything. I mm-hmm. get inspiration from anyone who is standing up against the status quo, right? Mm-hmm. You, you take people like like Marsha P. Johnson, who is a Black trans sex, sex worker that started the Stonewall riots, which we now know as Pride, right? Mm-hmm. Someone that, mm-hmm. that, that, that was not taken seriously back then has changed the mm-hmm. world simply by saying, this is not okay. This is not right. Just the courage, right? To have the courage, the courage to do it. Yep. Absolutely. And then, you know, you look at people like, like Sheryl Sandberg, you look at, um, it, it's not always tech for me. It, it, no, it's it's the small moments mm-hmm. of inspiration. It's the, it's the, it's anyone that has the courage to speak up against the pack and say, this doesn't feel good. Does it mm-hmm. not feel good for anyone else? Am I alone in this not feeling good? That's what gives me, gives me inspiration to keep going. I love that. I love that because that is such a tough thing to do. And people who do that, I have a lot of admiration for them because they are brave enough and showing that confidence that they're not the only one feeling like that. Yeah, absolutely. And Brene Brown's Dare to Lead, book, mm-hmm. she talks about, you know, we don't just need, and I might have put my own spin on this, so might not be verbatim, but we don't just need safe spaces. We need brave spaces. Yeah. And it's so powerful to me. And it's, it's, it's hard in corporate America. It's hard in some big companies to, to be the only one, especially if you're in a woman or in any sort of minority group, when everybody's like, yep, uh-huh, 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 to be the only one being like, yo, this is okay, is terrifying. Mm -hmm. It is terrifying, but, you know, we need to be brave. We need to have a voice in everything we do. And I think that is something all women should, all people should strive for, you know, to have that voice. And um, I know women in general don't have that confidence. Usually they don't have that voice at the table a lot of times, but everyone should be inclusive so that everybody has a voice. Absolutely. And it's also our job being, I believe it's my job as, as a person who does have the most power in the room to, if I am the person with the most power in the room to step aside, right? That's a Mm -hmm. part of being inclusive sometimes is being like, Hey, I'm not going to take up all the airtime talking. I have to be the one to stop talking so that my team can talk because they won't Mm -hmm. talk over me. And being aware of that of that privilege of having the mic first and 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 for the longest airtime, it's my job to to stop so that other people can have a turn. Yeah, and then just being aware of that, you know, to say I need to stop so that my team can speak is such a powerful piece. The awareness sometimes is half the battle. Like I said, there's so many unconscious biases. People talk all the time, but they don't even know that they're doing that. So the awareness takes a lot of reflection and understanding who you are, and then really changing, you know, changing from inside, because those difficult conversations is where the change comes in. It doesn't come in from the easy conversations. That's so true. Um, Glennon Doyle's book, I I seem to be citing a lot of books right now, which I don't Mm -hmm. normally do. But um, Glennon Doyle's book, Untamed, she, she, her, her tagline is, we can do hard things. And I think about that often before, you know, the speaking up in the quiet moments, before the, the self-reflection moment is like, okay, we can do hard things. We're going to yep. do this. We're going to move forward. It's scary. And we're going to do it anyway. Awesome. 
I love your energy around that. That's great. Um, okay, so I love to travel and I always get ideas from my podcast from other people as to where they've traveled to. So what is your most favorite place that you've traveled to and why? Mm -hmm. I have a few favorite places in the world. Southeast yeah, Asia in general. Have to be one. Doesn't have to be one. Yeah. Southeast Asia, Asia in general um, is one of my favorite regions, places around the world. Um, I love going to Thailand and Cambodia um, often. And mm -hmm. it just it gives me the ability to center so easily and be present so much more um there's just Why like this groundingness um i think the culture is more present mm -hmm. and interactive uh and then also when i'm i'm detached from from my technology and detached from work and able to you know practice my rituals and and do yoga and meditate and, and drop in, I'm able to just, I don't know, be more free, I guess. Yeah, that's amazing. I, you know, that's really important if that culture and that location can give you that freedom to be more present because one of my 2022 um, resolutions or like my daughter does, she comes up with a theme word for the year, and then she follows that theme for the whole year. And um, hers this this year is patience because she has kids, and you know she needs to practice more patience. And I was thinking of that, and I thought, what is mine going to be? And mindfulness and being present is really my theme for 2022 because in this world. It's so easy to get distracted. We have so many things calling for our attention and there's so many different means of communication that you get lost and you, you're constantly going and it's very hard to be mindful at, you know, when you're, you need to be present with the people that you're with. And so that's one of my 2022 uh, themes is to really focus on that. So that just gave me a lot of pause to think, you know, I need to think about what areas and what locations that I travel to um, give me that ability to be more present. So I love that you said that. Yeah, I love that. I love your theme of the year too. Um, <laughs> I I do a similar thing at, at winter solstice at, at New Year time of mm -hmm. writing what I'm releasing for the year and, mm -hmm. and then what I want to walk into the year with. So so similar little ritual that I do. Um, this year for me, what I was releasing was the narratives that I say about myself. So mm. when I'm like, I am this, I am that. Sometimes I continue to repeat those, even though I may not be that anymore. Mm -hmm. So just being aware of what I'm speaking into existence is representative of who I am today and not just the stories that I've told for so long. Yeah, that is so important. That self-talk makes you who you are. It puts out that into the universe and it, you're attracted to those things so so great that you are changing that that talk track yeah thanks i appreciate that mm -hmm. and then what is your looking forward this year has really been or i'm really approaching this year with clarity is what i'm I'm searching mm -hmm. for. So I've caught myself thinking I'm being clear and then I'm not being clear <laughs> or mm -hmm. it's not being received in a clear way. And I actually wrote down something that I was going to tweet recently, which I was like, being a founder is explaining your vision in 18 different ways in like is in like math and writing and then in video and then in talking mm -hmm. and realizing that really to get my vision out, and all the levels to get what I need and what I want out of my personal life. Mm -hmm. We have to speak those things and explain those things sometimes in more than one way. 
because what's so known to us in our body, we may not be getting out of our mouth in the same right. level of clarity that we think we are. So have you ever thought about, and I've been thinking about this and wanted to get your thoughts. I, I was thinking if I pick 10 friends and I um, send them an email and I say, give me like the three qualities or the three things that stand out to you about me. And it would be really interesting to me to see how other people perceive me rather than just how I perceive me. Thoughts on that? I mean, I have two thoughts, right? Okay. Um, one is like, I love that. And then the other one is um, people's opinions of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, I have it in both ways, right? And right. It, it, it for me is sometimes I, in the past for me, I've gotten too focused on that. And it lets it dictate the way that I act in a way that could be more harmful then it is positive for me. I'm so right? glad I asked you. That is such a great, that's such great insight. I never, you know, because really what you learn is you can't let other people's thoughts rule you. And I never thought of right. it that way, but that's really interesting. Right. Yeah, hmm. it, it, it's good on both sides, right? It's like, I talk about this moment of pause a lot. So I believe that we get to decide what, what comes into our, our, our body or our energy. And that could be like news, it can be food, it can be people's opinions, right? Like anything that, that's coming into us. Mm -hmm. I like to take a second to pause and say, is this, this mine? Mm -hmm. And when someone says, hey, Jennifer, you're this, or you make me feel this, I'm like, is that mine? Mm. On one hand, like validating the person, if we want to preserve the relationship and of all of that is, is absolutely important and, and people's feelings need to be validated. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that we have to take them on as, as truth, our tr truth. It can be mm -hmm. their truth and it doesn't have to be my truth. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's allowed me to, to be able to say, thank you for your opinion. Thank you for your feedback. And I do need to process on that. Or thank you for your opinion, thank you for your feedback. But then I go, that's not mine. And I'm throwing mm -hmm. it over my shoulder. <laughs> like I'm not I taking that, that on. I'm sorry mm -hmm. that you feel that way, but it could be a projection. It might not have anything to do with you. See, I love that because I need to learn that. <laughs> it's hard. It's yeah. so hard. But that's such a big accomplishment in my eyes that you can listen to it, process, decide, is that who I want to be? And then toss it if it's not, you know? Yeah, it's a practice. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn from this and think about that and, and do some of that. <laughs> that would be great. I love that. Yep. Yep. All right. So this has been so amazing. I just love talking to you. And um, so in closing, you know, this podcast is focused on bridging the, the pay and culture and uh, gender gap for women in technology. In closing, what, would, what advice would you give a woman considering a career in tech? Find a mentor and do mm -hmm. it anyway. It's awesome. going to be hard and do it anyway. <laughs> um, That's right. Um, but, but mentorship and al and cheerleaders one of my mentors calls them cheerleaders right we have mentors that were there for advice and are there to you know help us personally our cheerleaders are the people that will bring up our names in other rooms mm -hmm. so they're, they're the ones who are who are, are speaking us into existence in rooms that we're not in and th those cheerleaders will ha have changed my life right i mm -hmm. when we started audit mate i had no tech back background whatsoever i knew that it would work i had some some potential of getting funding but they were like well how are you going to do it you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um and i cold emailed a woman on linkedin um who was a senior vice president of a major tech company here in san francisco and I was like, hey, I'm a non-technical founder. 
here's what's going on. Anyway, you could chat. Mm -hmm. And we talked on the phone and she said, Ashley, I'm going to lend you a little credibility. Hmm. And she got on a call with investors with me and, and built some data architecture diagrams for me to the point that I was able to get funded. And then she was basically, good luck kid, call me if you need me. <laughs> um, but, awesome. but without, with, it was, it's so amazing. But without the bravery to cold email a woman mm -hmm. that we, I thought would never even write me back, Automate would not be where we are today. Yeah. That, that's kudos to you to just take that first step to have the courage to do that. Because a lot of people in their head would say, oh, she's not going to respond. She doesn't have time for me. She doesn't even know who I am. And, you know, right. can kind of get rid of that thought. But you took that action, which is so great. So great. Thank so you, do it that. and have some cheerleaders behind you, huh? That's the mm -hmm. advice. Yep. That's great advice. Great advice. So, Ashley, how can our listeners get a hold of you if you can share some ways for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. I would say I'm most active on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. um, Ashley Wilson. I do have a Twitter at Elevator Dad, but I'm not as active on Twitter. Um, and then you can find us at automate.com. Great. Well, we will put that in the show notes as well. Ashley, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope to have you on the on a show in the future. It was a pleasure talking to you, too. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Tech in the Right Direction. Please take a minute to subscribe or follow so that you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to like, share, and comment. Thank you. See you next week. From IT skill enhancements to end user adoption training, Directions Training is your resource to help optimize the effectiveness of your technology investments. Over half a million students have taken advantage of our wide selection of technology and business training solutions covering the most popular applications today, such as Microsoft 365, Azure, Windows 10, and more. As a podcast listener, we invite you to take advantage of an exclusive offer. Receive 30 days of free access to our Microsoft official curriculum on-demand courses for IT professionals or end users. Visit us at www.directionstraining.com slash podcast to claim this offer today. Hurry, this offer is only available for a limited time. Success is a journey. Ask for directions.